A thesis verse comes from this 11th verse. And here's what it says. The crowds were saying, underline those two words in your Bible, the crowds. The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Amen. Brothers and sisters, with the help of your prayers and the leadership of the Holy Spirit, we want to preach to you briefly this morning on the subject of no child left behind. No child left behind. Friends, so far in 2024, I've been preaching to you on our financially based themes around the church theme this year, which is filling your spiritual bank account. As your pastor, I care far less about what's going on in your financial bank account, and I care far more about your spiritual bank account. The reason is because whether or not you have dollars and cents in your financial bank account will not matter when you close your eyes on this side of glory. But what you have in your spiritual bank account is going to make a whole lot of determinations of when you get to the other side of glory. What you have in your financial bank account may impact how you live for the four score and some years that God gives you on this earth. But what you have in your spiritual bank account will determine how you will live in eternity and since you're going to spend far more time in eternity than you shall ever spend walking on the top side of the soil, to me it behooves you to focus on your spiritual bank account more than your financial bank account. However, this day is a great day of the church. We call today in the great liturgical calendar of the Christian church Palm Sunday. And I would ask that you would allow me to take a quick detour from our theme to highlight a very highly necessary practical and spiritual lesson that Palm Sunday teaches us. We've entitled the sermon this morning, No Child Left Behind. And this sermon title actually is not a nod to the 2002 No Child Left Behind Act that President George W. Bush signed into law. Actually, for those of you who've been with me for a little while, you will remember this is a nod to the sermon I preached in May 2015 entitled The Paradox of No Child Left Behind. For brevity, I will not re-preach the entire sermon, although it is an oldie but goodie. You should go back and listen to it. But I will share with you that that message came out of John chapter 17, and it focused on the fact that when Jesus prepared for Pentecost and ultimately returned to heaven to be with his father, it wasn't a no child left behind endeavor. In fact, when you think about Pentecost, Jesus was the only one who got raised up into heaven. So instead of no child left behind, it was every child left behind. Jesus, you see, gave us the gospel, and we offered in that sermon that he left all of us behind so that we could share the gospel with everyone in our lives. You and I were here to give the gospel to our friends and our family members and our neighbors, the people we like and the people we don't like, to ensure that in that great getting up morning, no child will be left behind. So in Pentecost, every child had to be left behind. Whereas the Bush legislation was intended to save the children educationally by not leaving them behind, the paradox in the gospel is that Jesus intended to save the children by leaving every child behind, that the truth might go forward. On this particular Palm Sunday, 10 years later, I want to update our thinking when we transition here in the Bible from the narrative of Jesus' life from Pentecost and go back to Palm Sunday. The Bible teaches us that by the time we get to the 21st chapter of the book of Matthew, Jesus has done his job. Jesus has worked his ministry. He has been accountable to all that God has called him to do. 
Many of us, in effect, would call Jesus' ministry comprehensive because he not only preached the gospel, but he interacted with the community while he preached the gospel. To say that he lived and worked among the people is actually an understatement because Jesus made a point of being with the people and sharing the gospel with the people and not just the people he liked but even the people he didn't like. The Bible teaches us that Jesus would hang around with the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the lepers and the fishermen and the children and the temple leaders and the disciples and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Quite literally, if you were breathing in and out, you could get some of this work too. Jesus was available for all people at all times. He didn't necessarily like all people. You got to go back and read the Bible closely. He let some people know, mm, you're not my cup of tea. But he still was trying to save their souls. Because Jesus' point was, even though you're not my cup of tea, God created you. And so you are God's cup of tea. And since God created you, even if you don't have the sense mama gave you, we still are going to try to get you into heaven. Indeed, Jesus was sent for all people, and, and he lived that out by being a man of the people. But alas, like all good things, Jesus' life and ministry had to come to an end. And I was wondering why it's so dark in here. Can you turn the lights on? I just realized they're off. The light's right there. Can you hit that button? Unless then are they not working? You know what I'm saying? I need the light on me. You know, I'm... I was about to say it. It was right here on my tongue. They, look, no, won't it do it? God is able. He's able. There are two of them. Indeed, Jesus was sent for the people, and he lived that, that out by being a man of the people. But all good things must come to an end. A close reading of the New Testament's four Gospels will yield to you the stories that through Jesus' ministry teach us that as his ministry was coming to an end, he actually had visited the holy city of Jerusalem seven unique times. With Palm Sunday being the seventh and final time that he would come to Jerusalem because on this final time, at the end of the week, he was murdered in the city by the state so this teaches us that prior to Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on six previous occasions. He went to Jerusalem, brothers and sisters. And if Atlanta is the epicenter of black culture, then, um, then it is the case that Jerusalem was the epicenter of Jewish culture, Jewish faith, and religious clout. And here he came to do in the city what he was widely known for getting done outside the city. He came back into the city because the Bible teaches us that the spirit of the Lord was upon him. And so he came into the city to bring good news to the poor. He came back to the city to release captives. He came back into the city for recovery of sight to the blind. He came back to the city to let the oppressed go free. He came back to the city to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. On six different occasions, he came into the city to do what God had called him to do. It is the only city in all of scripture that he visited six times. It is the only city that he kept coming back to six times. Times. The Bible teaches us he walked all over Asia Minor and Cappadocia. He did things in all manner of cities. He healed in all manner of cities. But for some reason, six times, he kept coming back to Jerusalem. And a reasonable person ought to ask themselves, why in the world? With all the people in the world that need to hear the gospel, with all the people in the world that need to be saved, with all the people in the world that need your truth, with all the people in the world that need you to give sight to the blind, that need you to give thirst to the thirsty, that need you to feed the hungry, with all the people in the world that need the blessing of being in your presence, why would you keep going back to Jerusalem? The reason the Bible teaches us is that every time he went to Jerusalem, if you read your Bible closely, his trip was cut short 
because his teachings were not received by the Jewish leaders. The establishment didn't want his brand of ministry. The ecclesiastical elite did not want a new way of doing ministry. They were not interested in a new way of connecting with God. And the center of Jewish faith wanted it to stay status quo. And her leaders wanted to continue to receive the financial and the personal and the egotistical benefits that came behind being the conduit to God. As opposed to teaching God, they can get to God on their own. Leave here, they told Jesus. Or something bad is going to happen to you. Leave here or your ministry is going to be cut short. Leave here or we will end your life. Not only are you not welcome in this city, Jesus, but actually you're not safe here. And six times this joker kept going back to a city where he was not welcome. Six times he kept going back to a city where he was not safe. And a reasonable person has got to read the Bible and say, Jesus, the smartest man who ever walked the earth, why would you keep going back to a city where you were not welcome? Why would you keep going back to a city where you are not safe? Why would you keep going back to a city where the leadership didn't want you? Six trips before the final trip. And even his homeboys told him, bro, we're not safe in Jerusalem. John said he came into town to celebrate the Passover, but he had to leave because they were trying to kill him. John 5 and John 7 says, on two separate occasions, he came for the celebration of the tabernacles, which is a Jewish holiday, but both times he had to leave. Luke 5 offers off a different account in the second year of his ministry when he went back for the Passover a second time. The first year of your ministry you went, they tried to get rid of you. You waited a year later and you went back again. And still, he had to leave. Matthew 19 teaches us that he came to celebrate Hanukkah and he had to leave. Mark chapter 10 teaches us he came to celebrate the celebration of Purim in the Jesus Jewish holiday and he had to leave. Six unique Jewish holidays. And each time he had to leave. And Jesus like a good Jew who understood that the Bible in their day, so-called the Torah, required them to return to Jerusalem on these holy days. And so he would always go back, even though it wasn't safe. But even though he was going back because the book told him he should go back, he was going back because his heavenly father told him he should go back. But like a very good marketing executive, he knew I'm going back when there's a high number of people in the city. I'm going back when the most hearts are present and available for the truth. I'm not going back when it's safe for me. I'm going back when it's in their best interest to hear this truth that I have to offer. I'm going back when there's the most concentrated number of ears that can hear this truth that I am giving. I'm going back when the people's minds are on God anyway because everybody came back to Jerusalem when God told them to come back. And since they're here because God called them, I'm going to come back at a time when they can hear me. God is in them and God will be with me. So even though I'm not saved, I'm going to keep going back. And there was Jesus each time dragging his disciples, kicking and screaming, complaining. Why do we have to go back to Jerusalem? Didn't you notice they tried to kill us last time we were here? Didn't you remember the last time they told us to get out of their city? Jesus, there's so many many other cities that we could go to, so many other places where we are welcome, so many other places where we actually have a place where there's a roof over our head and food provided in our bellies. Why would we go to the city where we can't even get a roof over our head? Why would we go to the city where they don't even want to feed us? Why would we go to the city where we have to hide everywhere we go? Because if the Pharisees find out where we are, they're going to kill you and they're going to kill us. And bro, if you're not concerned about your life surely I am concerned about mine why 
Did he keep going back? His life is threatened. He had to leave. And what I want to ask you this morning is if there was a place where your life was at risk, would you go back six times? If there was a place where you were unwanted, where your life was threatened, where, where people did not want you around, would you keep going back six times? So a reasonable reader of scripture has got to ask themselves, why in the world would Jesus continue to do this? Why would he put himself in such danger? Why would he subject himself to such harm and such ridicule and such shame? Why would he knowingly go back into a burning building wearing gasoline drawers? This doesn't make any sense. Jesus, why would, that joke was funny. Come on, y'all, I write these jokes and put them right in the middle of the sermon and my job is to keep preaching, but you're supposed to laugh when I write the joke. You should see me when I'm typing the sermon. I'm like, oh, they're gonna laugh at this one. Y'all just sat there straight face. Loosen up, folks. Man, that was a good joke. I gotta I go back to the drawing board. Mm. I know you people online laugh, thank you for laughing at my jokes. I work hard on these things. This preaching thing don't work out. My comedy career gonna take off. <laughs> now you laugh. Why in the world would you go back into the middle of a war zone knowing that you were the cause of the conflict and that the people were gonna try to kill you? Jesus, this doesn't make any sense to me. This particular verse in scripture, it boggles my mind. They knew who you were. They referred to you as the prophet. They watched you as you were coming back. Surely, as you got on that cult, somebody ran and told the Pharisees, there he is. Surely, as you sent them to go get your room ready for the Last Supper, they told the Pharisees, there he is. Surely, you knew there was one among you in your disciples who was going to betray you and bring Bring them into the garden of Gethsemane to get you. You knew this was going on, yet the Bible says the seventh time you went back. Six previous times they, you had gone into the city and they had tried to kill you. Six previous times your life had been in danger. You didn't have any more security. You didn't show up with any more disciples. You didn't have any weaponry to go with you. There was no secret service. You didn't have anybody in a Tahoe in front of you and a Tahoe behind you to keep you safe. And you kept going back. Why in the world, Jesus, this does not make any sense to me that you would keep going back into this city. This Palm Sunday day that we celebrate in this church where we put palms on our shirts and we put palms in poinsettias in the windows. It doesn't make sense to me. The risk, Jesus, the harm, the pain, the struggle, the ultimate murder that was coming in your life. Why would you keep going back to this city? And then... The Holy Spirit answers the question for us. I did not go back just to fulfill the prophecy that is in scripture. I did not go back because I am a glutton for punishment. I did not go back because I wanted the Pharisees to think that they were winning. I did not go back because I enjoy pain and I wanted to be crucified. I went back for you. You. You, the Christian, the creation of God, you, the person who God reached into the dust of the earth and blew the breath of life into your being, you, the person who, when you were born, God had already named you and had assigned you as a child of God, you, who the Holy Spirit was already in your spirit before you were thinking about the spirit, you, the one who God was thinking about before you were thinking about God, I put my life at risk for you. When I weighed my options of protecting my own self-interest or advancing your relationship with God, I chose you over me. This, brothers and sisters, was a no-brainer for Jesus. Jesus threw his own self-interest out the window. He threw his own safety out the window because he knew that you who were watching online and you who were sitting on the sanctuary, he knew that one day you would choose God and God had already chosen you. 
Palm Sunday is the essence of the gospel. It is the power of Jesus' love. It is the passion demonstrated by Jesus' actions. Before I ever got up on a cross, I had to go back into the city that God stipulated I was going to be murdered in, and I didn't want to go. I was stressed out to go, but when I saw your face in my spirit, when I saw the life that you were going to live, when I thought about the love of my God that you were going to share, when I thought about the forgiveness that you were going to offer to other people, when I recognized that you were going to take the gospel and lift other people up out of the muck and the mire, when I thought about the hungry people that you were going to feed, the thirsty people that you were going to give drink to, the helping people that you were going to lift out of their difficulty, I had to go back into that struggle and I did it for you. Palm Sunday is the day that you realize Jesus said, no child shall be left behind. I'm going to go and do you about my father's business. I am going to go and get up on that cross so that you can be back in relationship with me. And the best thing you can do for me is not put a palm on the lapel of your jacket. The best thing you can do for me is not walk into the sanctuary with other people who were here last Sunday. The best thing you can do for me is not sing songs or listen to sermons or read your Bible or pray. The best thing you can do for me is go back into that life that I died to give you. To go back to that place that I died to give you and share the same love and the same hope and the same sacrifice with somebody else. I could have walked away and been Jesus and had a famed career of healing and power and recognition. I could have walked away and made it all about me and forgotten about everybody else. But I put myself in harm's risk and I went back a seventh time into danger for you. And so if you really want to honor me on Palm Sunday, it's not about the fact that you came to church. What are you going to do when you leave the church? If you really want to honor me on Palm Sunday, then, then remember that I came back into Jerusalem for you. So who in your life do you have to go back for? Who in your life could you have walked away from because it was too painful? Who in your life could you have stayed away from because the struggle was too bad? Who in your life did you decide I'm not going to deal with anymore because you are emotionally killing me? But God, because you came back for me. And I was no child left behind in your life. Then I commit this Palm Sunday that when I take off this palm, I'm going to put on the spirit of the living God. And I'm going to ask you, God, who is the no child left behind in my life? And the same way, God, you came searching after me, I commit today that I will go searching after them. God bless you, Providence.